Here we go. Hi, everyone. Hi. Welcome back. Welcome back. Oh, it's been a long time, right, Yana? <laughs> yeah, another year, yes. This is the fourth season? Fourth? Our, our fourth season. Imagine when we start was uh, a, a, a dream, and now we can see everything works fine. And this year, we have many surprises. Let's start our tradition in our traditional way. So uh, if you were new over there, we are Phenom Force, which is this learning community for plant phenotyping. And we, when we created this group in 2020, it was more than, for example, showing results more. We were looking for how people are doing phenomics, how I can go to my field, collect images or any digital information and really evaluate and have meaning of this data. So that's what that's from where Phenom Force come, Rihanna and Ahita. Yes, and we were also in a pandemic, so it was kind of way also to get engaged in phenomics. And we started this as an idea to connect beginners with the experts and like share knowledge in this field for everybody across the world. So um so if you first of all you are if you are on YouTube, please subscribe to our youtube channel so you will see and get notification about our future workshops and uh, as you have seen we have this is the fourth season that we do and all our workshops are available on our youtube channel and so you can go and watch them again and use them also for training yourself or anybody else yeah um, each season we have a, a main topic where we are talking about different parts in phenomics and this year we are talking about root phenotyping right yes we yes and also we want to say that um we have three new members in the you know, course administrative uh, group. So since we grew up so much, we are we need more help, and so we have three new uh, talented um, scientists that they join us, and we will put them on the screen so they can introduce themselves. So we have Caroline and Maria Roberta and Maya. So. Thank you guys and uh, oh, uh, so thank you guys for joining us and so I want to say that this workshop was their idea they have been organizing it and contacting the speakers and preparing so this is really their first work with Phenom Force so we welcome them and thank them for their their uh, work and so if you guys yeah. want to introduce yeah. So. Yeah, we are very, very happy and glad that you guys accept to be part of our group and all work that you guys put together uh, this last month to organize this symposium. It's all your hands. So thank you so much. You can introduce yourselves now. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, want to start. All right. Hello, everyone. I am Maria de Oliveira. I'm a, a PhD student at North Dakota State University. I'm working with plant breeding and genetics, and specifically with hydroput phenotyping used drones and robots. And I'm very glad uh, that I had this opportunity to, to, to join Phenom Force. Thank you very much. And hope you guys enjoy. <laughs> yeah. uh, Gerline, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gerline Carr. I'm a PhD candidate here at University of Florida. I'm working on tomato flavor using integrated omics and breeding techniques to understand flavor and improve it. And my major advisor is Dr. Harry Klee. I'm very excited to see all the workshops and thank you all for registering. Thank you. And then, um, oh, Maya, thank you. Ma you're mute. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Here everybody. Thank you to everybody that somebody has a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Maria. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the John Innes Center in UK. And uh, well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Anarita and Felipe for this opportunity. And it was because of them uh, a while ago, I got to learn about the uh, root phenotyping with image analysis with the uh, Resolution Explorer. And that kind of made a quite impact in, in my current research. I'm a soil scientist but I work with wheat and the impact of wheat roots in, uh, in soil health. 
And I'm particularly interested in the impact of uh, weed root exudates in, um, in microbiome processes and microbiome composition, particularly with a focus in nitrogen cycling and how we can control uh, nitrogen. And well, I'm really glad you have joined us today and I hope you will join us in the next weeks. We have made a huge effort this year to, to get a good uh, group of uh, root phenotyping experts. And uh, I think it's time to start. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us, all the three of you. Um, yeah, Maya, do you want to introduce our channel? Uh, Yes, absolutely. So, well, you can find uh, more details about uh, this initiative, uh, previous work, previous uh, uh, previous uh, uh, workshops in the website. It is uh, here. Uh, then, of course, we you can follow us on Twitter. We keep updating as much as possible to keep you on track of what uh, that we have been doing and we are, we are doing. Uh, all the uh, past uh, uh, workshops and all the workshops of this series will be available uh, forever on YouTube, so you just have to subscribe to the channel. Uh, any questions you have, any interest, any suggestions, you can mail us in this, uh, in, in this Gmail account. And we are also on Slack. If you are a fan of Slack, then uh, you can join us there for many interested in discussions. Carlin, you're muted. <laughs> My bad, sorry. Thank you everyone for joining today's workshop. I'm very excited to introduce our first speaker, Abram George Smith from the University of Copenhagen. He'll be presenting Root Painter Workshop, Deep Learning Segmentation of Biological Images with Corrective Annotation. And in your Eventbrite ticket, you have received all the links related to the documentations and the GitHub pages for Root Painter Workshop. Welcome, Abraham, and I hope you all enjoy today's workshop. Thank you for accepting our invitation, Abraham. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Yeah, I want to start just by saying thanks for inviting me. And uh, I have no idea how many people are watching on YouTube or watching at all, but thank you to everyone who's turned up. Um, and I just posted a link in the comments uh, that somebody yeah. is. Yeah, I'm going to put it now. Yeah, so this is the link. Yeah, so this later on, there's going to be some links that I'm going to ask people to click on, and uh, you can find them on the corresponding slides. So now you can see the same slides as me. Um, and also, all the papers I discussed have links in them uh, in, the, in the comments to those slides. So, um, anyway, thanks for inviting me. Um, so, today I'm going to talk about. Um, the Root Painter software, which is uh, for the segmentation of biological images uh, with corrective annotation. So, um, and my, um, so I'm a computer science student, um, a PhD student at the University of Copenhagen, um, and this is a Phenome Force workshop, of course. Um, so, yeah, my background in root phenotyping um, actually started with a fairly seemingly primitive method. So, this is a um, some uh, a facility near Copenhagen where I used to work as a research assistant. Um, and you can see here, these are the four meter high um, rhizo boxes where people are studying deep root growth. Um, and they used to image the, well, they still do image the, the sides of these um, rhizo boxes using this uh, camera here, as you can see in the middle image. Um, and they, they capture like a few hundred images uh, from each time point. Um, and then what they used to do um, is they used to overlay a grid over the images, as you can see on the right here, uh, and count um, the number of root intersections with that grid. Uh, so this kind of line intersect or grid intersect method um, seems really, really uh, basic and that, you know, you don't even need software to do it. But actually, um, it's actually quite a fast way to get a lot, uh, approximate level of root length in a large number of images, assuming you have to do manual annotation. And that's what they were doing at the time. Um, and I thought, this is, you know, this is crazy. Surely we should use software to do this. Um, but at the time, we didn't really find any existing solutions. Um, so I embarked on a project uh, as part of my master's project at the time to do um, train a UNET model, which was the sort of state-of-the-art uh, neural network for segmentation at, at the time. Um, so we did a kind of classic uh, supervised learning project for this um, to address this and we had uh, per pixel image annotations created using Photoshop. So basically we just uh, created a layer in Photoshop and traced the roots. 
If you're going to do something like this, I'd recommend using GIMP instead of Photoshop because it's a lot easier working with open source software. Um, and then what we did is we trained, uh, we used 28 images in, in machine learning, what we call a training set, uh, nine images in validation and 10 images in test set. Um, so this is just sort of a standard way to kind of split a data set up into you know, how we optimize the model, how we validate the model, and then at the end, how we measure you know, how well it might perform on new images. Um, and we use this PyTorch machine learn learning library to do this, um, fairly sort of standard approach. Um, and these were results that we got back then. So this is a couple of years ago now. And we had, uh, so this is, this is a, just a small subregion of the photo um, of some roots in soil, as you can see. And on the left, you can see the, um, the root in the soil. Um, and then, so that's image A and B, you can see the manual annotation. So this is what was done in Photoshop um, of that actual root. Um, and then C, what you see is the uh, unit segmentation. So this is a model prediction of that root, this segmentation. Um, so this segmentation is something that we do to replace uh, the more manual methods for me getting measurements of root length, which is what they're interested in. We treat this segmentation step as an intermediate step but we then get the traits from that segmentation. Um, so in this kind of context, um, segmentation means we're kind of having a sort of pixel classifier. We're saying for each pixel in the image, is it is it root or not? Um, and then uh, D is actually uh, showing the difference between B, the manual annotation, and C, the automatic uh, segmentation. So the, on D, we actually have the errors. Um, I call these the unit errors, but that's not really fair on unit because uh, if you look at this red region here, um, that's a what, what we identified we claimed as a false positive, um, but actually because the, the manual annotator didn't annotate it. But when we went back to inspect the data set and inspect this error, uh, the manual annotator um, was like, oh, actually the model got this right. So there was, and also the, the boundaries we found here was where the manual annotations were, um, you know, these are really primarily errors with the manual annotation basically. So we found large regions of the images had a higher quality with the automated approach in terms of the segmentation than the actual manual annotations that we'd use to train, validate, and test the model. Um, and then we went to validate that approach on a uh, larger data set that wasn't used in any of this kind of training or validation procedure of you know these manual measurements of root length of over 800 images uh, of roots and found um, a pretty strong correlation. I think we got a R squared of 0.92 on this data set with over 800 samples, 800 images analyzed. Um, so, um, yeah, and then we uh, published this eventually in Plant Methods. This is a segmentation of roots and soil with UNET. And we have the paper available open access. We have the images with the annotations available there. So people are currently using those for new research projects. Uh, that's all open access. And the source code is open and the model is available. Um, but it kind of looked like, okay, did, did we solve the problem here? So, you know, why, why would we need to make root painter? You know, what is the issue? So I got a kind of... Um, I got a job uh, actually working full time after, so that was my master's project, sorry, back in time. That was my master's project. I did this root segmentation stuff with UNIT. And then I got hired full time working at this facility called Radimax. So this is a facility uh, just outside Copenhagen in Tarstrup in Denmark. Um, and they, they basically analyze hundreds of thousands um, of root images every year, um, different uh, cultivars, different species, and um, also, um, you know, using four channel images. So they have different wavelengths, they use this multi-spectral camera and they're going down to, you know, maybe two meters deep or so. Um, so it's like, you know, like larger, much larger amounts of heterogeneity in the images compared to those original riser box images I showed you. Um, and you can see here the camera um, and the sort of the, the industrial scale they're going out with writing max. So they, they already had a system when I arrived to process root images, um, which was using a kind of like, um, a sort of assumption that people make about multispectral imaging, but it actually means something uh, in terms of you know what you what you're quantifying biologically. Um, and with roots, it's a very dangerous assumption to make. But multi, I think multispectral imaging is is um, it's often it's often uh, I think oversold in kind of root image analysis. I don't think it'll necessarily guarantee you you're quantifying what you're looking at. But the assumption they made with Radimax was that uh, bright roots with a certain reflectance pattern in this uh, multispectral image would be sort of um, uh, they would be roots and everything else would be soil, uh, but the system wasn't quite able to, to do that. And so we tried to take my deep learning approach that I tested out in that segmentation of roots and soil with UNET and apply it to this Radimax data sets. 
Uh, and we had some problems. So the first one, as I mentioned, it was multispectral images. So that model I trained, did all that validation. The first data set I actually tried to apply it on for a real world use case, it, it has this huge, what we call in machine learning, domain shift, which is where something is systematically different about the data set. And this is one of the main drivers of the approach that we take with Root Painter is the, the fact that um, the next data set you want to process typically has a large domain shift from all of the previous data sets you wanted to process. And it, actually in scientific research, this is kind of a given because we're, we're constantly under pressure to do novel research. So we have novel data sets. Um, so none of the models that we already have are able to adapt to those data sets. Typically, things might change. Um, so anyway, this data set had an extra channel. And we also found that some of the routes are quite dark in this data set. You see here on the left, is what we sort of, when the original system was designed, how we expected routes to be. And on the right was some of the routes that we ended up trying to quantify with image analysis, where it's actually darker than the surrounding soil. So traditional image analysis methods weren't really working. Um, so deep learning can solve these problems. We were able to train the network to solve these problems. Um, we also faced a lot of artifacts in this in working with Radi Radimax. So here's dew in the tubes. Uh, if you've worked with Minirizotron research, you'll, you'll recognize this. It's really hard to avoid this. Um, I think, uh, so this is like one of the problems that we, we had to kind of tackle in ReadyMax, but I kind of, I think it's also worth taking into account that there's a limit to what you can do with image analysis. If, if your artifacts are so bad, you might have to exclude just like portions of your data set. Um, so this is also the kind of false positives that we wanted to not get. So this is obviously not roots. These are artifacts from the construction of facility. And we had to train models or I had to train models to try to overcome these type of issues. Um, and this is also showing some of the reflection of the lighting as well. So these are the kind of artifacts and issues you get with mini Rhizotron imaging, um, scratches as well, as you, you will have seen if you work with these types of data sets. Um, but we were able to solve that simply by retraining the model, adjusting the hyperparameters, um, choosing which images we put in the data set. And these are some of the results. So this is a kind of a blurry image with some light reflection issues. Also, this is a faded route. So this is one of the darker ones. It's not so bright, even using this multi, um, uh, multi-spectral images, and we were able to train models to adapt to this. So this was just uh, re-annotate the images using GIMP, retrain those models using my classic supervised learning procedure that I kind of outlined with that segmentation of roots with UNET paper. Um, and some of the research we got out of this, so this is Tomka Wacker's paper. Um, just to give you an example of, you know, how is this actually relevant to, 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 to plant science? Because um, I'm more focused on, you know, computer science and segmentation. Um, this is some of the research that got out of some of the, 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 the phenotyping we did, the image analysis. So this is uh, looking at uh, deep root traits for nitrate uptake. This is work by Tom Kowaka and the other people you can see here. Um, so the, the investigation in this study was looking at what kind of um, uh, deep winter wheat root traits should we breed for and how predictive are these traits for deep nitrogen uptake and also to what extent are the traits genetically determined. Um, so in the Radimax facility, I put some links in the Google Slides if you want to read about the camera or the facility that's sort of in the comments under the slide. Um, it has a, um, a way to kind of control the uh, nutrients that are delivered to the plant. So you can kind of like deliver different, uh, you know, nutrients and things and traces into the facility as well. Uh, so you can quantify these things in relation to the observed traits. So you can quantify uptake in relation to the observed traits through the mini rhizotron tubes. Um, and so what you, this slide shows is how root, uh, the root profile, the root intensity uh, changes with different time points. And here's the tracer injection depth. So we have sort of nutrient analogs and things like this. Um, and, and on the right side, uh, we can see some figures that are kind of representing what I meant when I said different traits are compared in this study. So we have kind of the... Um, uh, deep root length um, and max rooting depth sort of defined in different ways. And we look at how do these traits help us, uh, you know, phenotype for different crops. Um, so yeah, some of the conclusions from that study that were the traits were able, the root traits were able to predict 25% of the uh, variation in nitrogen tracer uptake um, with the genotypic effect on uptake being 65%. Uh, and so basically it indicated that we can breed to some extent for deep nitrogen uptake in winter wheat uh, using this kind of AI automated image analysis. So there's a really large data set that would have been kind of infeasible to, to, manotate, to annotate manually. Um, so uh, some plant science came out of this, um, but I got some insights from the sort of phenotyping point of view in terms of 
the computer science, the machine learning aspect, and how do we, and, and, and I kind of got some personal insights about some of the problems of actually deploying this technology in a kind of real world facility. Uh, specifically, uh, retraining is often required to get the best results. And so you can't, you know, take, well, sometimes you can take a model that's already trained and it might work okay. Uh, but if you want the best results, you have to retrain. And if you want to handle artifacts or novel data sets, uh, you know, so my personal insight was that, yeah, retraining is required. Um, and also when you're doing retraining for especially large data sets that have problematic artifacts in them, like the one they showed you, uh, the hard examples are more valuable. So I used to think that random sampling was the way to go in data set design, and there's an argument for that. Uh, but sometimes you, you don't want to, you know, if you take a random sample of, of, you know, a relatively small size relative to an extremely large data set, you might miss some of those really problematic outliers that could have a, you know, that could cause a big problem for sort of the downstream analysis. Um, also, the annotation time um, can be reduced by editing the output of another network. So um, at one point, it was actually my job to annotate root images, and I am an extremely lazy person. So I started trying to use the output of one network and editing that to try to create my annotations in less time. Um, and that kind of worked pretty well. Um, also, the programming and hyperparameter tuning is a problematic bottleneck. And this is more on the research group setting. Um, if you have a, a pipeline or a workflow that actually design, requires custom code, every, you know, even if it's just you know, every month or two, uh, that, that becomes a huge bottleneck because not everyone is an expert in machine learning and programming. And, and you, we kind of want to develop systems that allow people to use them without having to have that specialization so they can be more um, accessible to biologists uh, from, from, you know, broader backgrounds, basically. Um, and so basically, uh, yeah, the final conclusion was really plant scientists need more autonomy when training deep learning models for image analysis. So um, I basically set out on a path to make myself redundant um, and I no longer have this job, so I was effective uh, by replacing myself with, with software. And that software was uh, Root Painter. So yeah, Root Painter was developed to fix these problems. Um, so this is the concept um, of Root Painter. Um, basically, um, on the left, you can see a photograph of some roots. This is from that riser box facility, um, the towers, what we call it in, uh, in Denmark. And then um, you can see some roots through some glass here. And on the right, you can see, um, shown in blue, the, the prediction of the model. And it has some false positives down at the bottom here and some false negatives where, so false positive is just a prediction of roots where there are no roots and false negative at the top, which is prediction of no, of, of no roots where there are uh, roots. Um, so it has some errors. You might want to improve this model. And uh, so then you can kind of assign these corrections. Basically, you would annotate the image uh, to indicate um, where the model is making mistakes. So, you you know, um, basically, you, you would assign a foreground annotation for the false uh, false negatives and background annotations for the false positives. And then the model would, as you can see on the right, would sort of over time adapt. Um, I'm showing here with the same image to illustrate the concept, but these in practical, in reality, would be like different images that we'll get a chance to work through today, sort of sequentially training the model as you work through the data set. Um, so I didn't know it at the time, uh, but this type of system falls under a class of methods called interactive machine learning. So these are human in the loop methods. Um, so in traditional machine learning, you might have, you know, you just kind of create an annotated data set and then train a model from that annotated data set. And then you just sort of hope for the best, uh, hope it works. And uh, whereas in interactive machine learning, we have a feedback loop. So it gives us, it gives the actual annotator um, a different level of control over the process. Um, so basically, the, the this diagram illustrates how it works. So it's kind of difficult to know where to start in this diagram, but yeah, you have the observation um, of of the model, sort of uh, of the model's predictions on the data. So the expert makes an observation and then corrects um, that you know corrects the prediction basically based on their kind of expert knowledge. Um, and then those corrections will get added to the labels, which will be used as input into the training process, uh, which will be combined with the data to generate more models. And this process just continues for as long as you want it. Um, and I talked about this providing the uh, annotator with more control. And one of the primary reasons for that is that you actually see the model predictions while you're annotating. So you get an idea of um, 
what type of weaknesses does your model have on a given data set, given the annotations that you've provided so far, and what kind of annotations would you want to provide from then on to address kind of weaknesses in the model. And that's where the protocol comes from. So Root Painter isn't just software, it's a protocol. So we propose this corrective annotation protocol, uh, and it's in the bottom of the paper, but this is, um, you know, all outlined of how to, how to do this annotation procedure. You can use the software however you want. It's open source, um, well, within the, the license, of course. Um, but you, you, you know, what we recommend is this corrective annotation protocol, which will allow you to hopefully uh, converge to, to a model that, that solves your, your problem. So uh, this diagram is from one of the very early preliminary tests we did with the software, um, where on the x-axis, you can see the images. So this is just, you know, the, how many images I've, I've sort of annotated at this point. And on the y-axis, you see the annotation that I've assigned for that image. Um, so what you're seeing here is that the amount of annotation that you assign for a given image uh, decreases over time. So images, you know, um, time is measured in number of images annotated here. Um, a question people often ask in machine learning projects is, how many images do I need to annotate um, to get my model to a given accuracy? And what I've been trying to say for quite a while now is that that's not the right question. The question is, well, there's, uh, there's a lot of different questions, but I, I think the, what the question I try to focus on in terms of root painter is more, um, what is the cost? Um, someone is asking to go through the suggestions before presenting the program. Um, okay, I can go through the suggestions. Uh, there's some suggestions. Where do I find the suggestions? Uh, in the comments? Is that right? I, I have to go check some comments now. Can we quickly run through the suggestion for attendees before opening the program such protocol? The suggestion for attendees. Um, maybe it's referring if you have specific suggestion for like before running the model, maybe I, I don't know exactly. Oh. Oh. The suggestions. Hmm. Um, well, there's some data to doubt. I mean, if you wanted to like follow along, is that what you mean? Like, if you want to like, what do you, how, what do you have to do to prepare? Um, Abraham, I, I wonder if he refers to the links that you send in preparation to install the, uh, to install the root painter and all the uh, other links that you send. I share them. We share them with him in the, in the tickets, in the Vembrite ticket. Yeah, we can also link them here. If there are specific link, we can link them to the uh, comments. So he has that. Yeah, so basically, um, so how the workshop is going to work today. Um, I think if you try to like follow everything I'm doing and listen to what I'm saying, it's, it's just going to be like too difficult. Um, so I think I'm going to kind of go through pretty fast today. And then, and then maybe you can like follow on with the YouTube video of the recording because it's all being recorded. And don't, because I think if you feel pressure to kind of keep up with everything I'm doing, it's going to be going like way too fast. And we're going to, you know, I'm going to have to like stop and figure out technical issues. So I have, you know, you, you need to inst like basically the collab tutorial. So maybe I should try to find that. Um, I will get, I, you know what, I will get to the collab tutorial like later on and it like kind of tells you like step by step how to do everything. Um, is that is that kind of? Yeah. Like yeah, I guess that really works. And we also can put here in the description the video afterwards, you know, more information. And then you can continue your presentation now and then we can get back to Christopher later. Also, like uh, if you have question for Abraham, we, we can give you the contact and uh, you can yeah no no christopher it's okay thank you yeah. for, for sunny um and then we you can reach out to him and i think he will be very happy to give you any support for the installation or any error that there is right abram um uh but there is also another question if you want to take it now um so uh, someone is asking, can we input blur images or they should go through some processing before we apply root painter model? Um, I think the easiest thing to do is just to try it. So there are cases where sharpening the image might be a good idea or adjusting the brightness of an image might be a good idea. Uh, so auto contrast or, or you know, sharpening. I would say that the big, a big challenge with, with uh, 
you have to think you're going to have to annotate these images. So if there's something you can do that makes it easier for you to see what it is you're going to annotate, then I would do that because a big challenge is data sets where the, the user can't really see what is the structure they're interested in. So if there's anything you know how to do to your images to make them like easier for you to see what's in them and for you to annotate what you're interested in, um, then I think uh, you should you should definitely do that. Um, but it, it will work fine, like it will work. So if your images are blurry, so I'm gonna show you today with some blurry images that are like, you know, it's difficult to see what's going on in some of the images. So you can just train on blurry images. It's not a huge issue. But if, I, I think if there's something you know how to do to improve the quality for yourself, I think you should do that so you can more clearly see what it is you're looking at. Um, and, and that should help the model as well, I guess. Thank um, you. All right, should I continue with my slides? I guess so. Yes, um, yes, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So uh, thanks for the questions. Um, so where was I? Yeah, so convergence. So yeah, we um, trying to tell the backstory here. So basically, um, um, yeah, so you start annotating some images. And as you can see from this plot, basically what we found is the amount of annotation required um, goes uh, is less and less as you annotate more images. Um, and and um, I talked a little bit earlier, so I'm going to go back. I need to find my place again. I kind of like lost track. So basically, it's also about, I want to talk a little bit about feedback and control. So basically, by putting the annotator in the loop, you're getting real-time feedback of the quality of your model. Um, and you can see how much annotation is, is required to fix it. And we're going to, I'll, I'll come back to that later in the metrics plots, which is a new feature that's been added. Um, so the software is um, also like a client server architecture. Um, so what that means is um, that so a big, uh, I don't want to say limitation, but it's a little bit of an annoyance with Rupina is it does require a GPU. Um, so what that means in practice is you need a way to connect. If you don't have a GPU on your laptop, which is powerful enough, normally it needs around eight gig memory in your GPU, then you need to connect to a remote GPU. And I'm going to kind of talk about the Colab Notebook a little bit today. But, that provides a way for people without a GPU or without access to a remote GPU to connect to the GPU like for free from Google. So that's kind of what we're gonna, so that's the most widely accessible method because you don't have to pay any money necessarily um, and everyone can kind of get started. Uh, but yeah, the, the way we developed it originally was around like a custom built like deep learning workstation um, and then the, that we put together in the lab and then different researchers could connect from their kind of like uh, laptops or desktop computers and they didn't need like a GPU on their computer. Um, and so yeah, this is um, basically makes it more uh, usable, user-friendly. You don't have to have a GPU on your own computer. You can connect to a remote GPU. There's also people using it with cloud services um, or connecting if your university has like a GPU cluster or you know somewhere like a high performance cluster in your university, you can get it set up with that and run it on your own laptop and connect to this high performance cluster somewhere else. Um, so, but the GPU is, is an essential part of Root Painter right now. We don't yet have a way to run it in a high performance way on CPU only, uh, but with Colab you can connect to a sort of free GPU. And one thing we found is that it didn't just work well for roots, or it didn't just work well for the original segmentation task we designed for, uh, because the model is quite versatile. So you can you can by 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 adjusting the annotations, you can actually quantify, you know, different structures um, or the um, you know, for example, root nodules, as shown in this image. Uh, so in the original root painter study, um, training this uh, nodules model took about. Um, one hour and six minutes, I think it was. Uh, and, and it just gives you an idea of, uh, you know, you can quickly test things out and prototype things. So if your images are blurry, for example, and you want to just see, does it work? You know, you can you can experiment and maybe in an hour or two, you'll have some idea of if it's going to work. Um, so the nodules data set, just to follow up, uh, Ford Denison has been using Root Painter um, for um, uh, nodule research. And he's looking at, um, so he's quantifying the nodules, as you can see in this image. Uh, and he's looking at host and post selection among rhizobia, different in efficiency. Um, so basically, he's uh, looking at um, how can we uh, select for legume cultivars um, that, that they select for uh, rhizobia that offer the best trade-offs in terms of nitrogen fixation versus the sort of metabolic cost of the plant. Um, so yeah, Root Painter is part of his pipeline. He has a lot of interesting... Um, other uh, technologies involved in his pipeline, including, uh, including like custom gas exchange mechanisms and things. I will add another link. So I've linked to his paper on this slide at the bottom, 
Um, I'll add another link to his YouTube video later because he has a he has a nice talk about how he's using AI in his root phenotyping approaches. Um, also, we tested it on biopores, another root related topic. Um, so this is uh, this is a, the, the data set that's available in the CoLab tutorial. So um, there was a question earlier about um, how, you know what you need to do, what are the suggestions before presenting a program, and everything is. There's a the collab tutorial, like you can just work through that. You don't need to, there's nothing specific to this workshop that you need to do. You just work through the tutorial and it should work. If it doesn't, you can, you know, contact me or put an issue on the GitHub. Let me know if there's an issue. Uh, but it's step by step how to do biopause. Today I'm going to cover roots instead. But the collab tutorial should be self contained and self explanatory and it includes this data set you can see here. So this one is, you know, again, a model trained in under two hours. And that means both annotation and training was completed in under two hours in this kind of feedback loop. Um, and then that, so this paper, this image is from the original root paint paper where we just tried it out on three different data sets. Um, but then Yusin went on, Yusin Han went on and did some more biopause research with root painter and actually found that doing this automatic analysis with deep learning was revealing new insights in um, the biopore data sets that he had access to that had already been published. So he reanalyzed them using this deep learning approach, which of course offers higher consistency across the data uh, and allows a more sort of a quantification of smaller biopores and things like this that you might not be able to do in manual approaches. Um, and, and found some new insights about the effects of deep tillage and soil biopores persisting for more than 50 years. And also from a, my, my perspective, a kind of machine learning and phenotyping perspective, he was he got some really interesting results about combining a variety of different data sets. Um, so I actually saw a question in one of the questions that, that someone proposed where they had like six different species and they wanted to ask, should they train a model for each or should they combine them together and train one model? And I think Houston Han's results here are telling you that you should try combining all your data and training one model. I think that will, um, so this connects nicely to some of the questions that uh, one of the participants put forward, uh, that combining data sets can actually help the accuracy on all the individual data sets whilst increasing annotation efficiency. So you have to do less annotation overall. Uh, and I put a link to this paper in the slides as well. And of course, we've evaluated Root Painter on Roots. Um, so this is the original images. So the Photoshop annotations I mentioned right at the start, those took uh, you know about half an hour each and we collected 50, that was over 50 hours of annotation to try out this UNET model. Um, and this was this model you can see here in these images, Get providing these segmentations that was in under two hours. Um, so that's both the training and segmentation time was, you know, was around two hours. Um, so you, and you have the result, you know, what you see is what you get. So it's, it's, it's a way to sort of rapidly complete these, these, these segmentation projects, these phenotyping projects uh, without having to do any kind of programming or anything like that. Um, and another root phenotyping study that's been done with Yusin Han again is the uh, this one. So someone actually talked about a little bit about root washing. Another participant question was actually about root washing, I believe. Um, and this paper directly, again, Yusin Han has directly investigated this using Root Painter um, to minimize the amount of um, manual labor spent with destructive root sampling. Um, so if you are actually you know, washing roots and this is really frustrating and you want to find a way out of this, you can just actually just do image analysis on your uh, dirty roots covered in soil. Um, and you can train a model, a root painter model, to segment the roots. Um, as you can see here, the, the red is the roots and the, 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 the black is the dirt. I mean, you have to be able to see, right? So that's, as I mentioned earlier, you have to be able to see what's in the images yourself because it's, you know, you annotate, you have to be able to annotate it and just decide for yourself. Um, but the measurement, you know, what we found in this study is that the measurements are basically the same of what you get. So instead of doing all this cleaning work to get this perfect specimen, you can just train a deep learning model to manually remove the dirt and the roots. Um, so I think there's definitely more scope for this in destructive root sampling of, you know, training models to automate more of those pipelines. Um, so this, this chart, just to explain, shows the, um, uh, the root length density of the um, complete extraction. So this is the man like completely washed and everything cleaned. This is the one where it's, uh, you know, we're using AI to kind of like segment it and we don't completely clean it. And, you know, for most, for most research questions, you're gonna get the same result. So root washing might not be, you know, it might be quicker in some cases to train a model than to wash your roots. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So this is, um, this is a, actually, I wanted to just show something completely different. So this is not roots, apologies, but um, this is a previous workshop. 
but it was a little bit more interactive. So if people want a workshop like this, we can do a follow-up one where they want to kind of, you know, have interaction. We got volunteers help you out. Um, but this is uh, Fernando um, Alvarez, and he 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 was he just turned up to this workshop with this data set of X-ray CT images of its uh, methane trapped in sand, and he wanted to quantify his methane. And we kind of like tried it out within the workshop, tested Root Painter, um, so he got it running on his own machine, and um, yeah, and a few months later he was able to get this, um, you know, part of his published research in gas bubble dynamics during methane hydrate formation and its influence on geophysical properties of sediment using high resolution synchrotron imaging and rock physics modeling. So, you know, it's fun just to try it out and see if it's relevant for your processing pipelines. And I think these workshops are a great way for people to just have a chance to test it for their uh, specific problems. Um, he, I also put in a preprint that Fernando published um, where he's actually comparing different unit segmentation methods for this task as well, um, that I think is an, a, an interesting study if you're interested in um, you know, X-ray images, which I think are coming increasingly relevant for root phenotyping as well. Um, this is a study, a recent study by Marilee Sell um, et al. And um, I, I wanted to talk about this, it's, it's root phenotyping, of course. Um, so this study is assessing the fine root growth dynamics of Norway spruce manipulated by air, humidity, um, and soil nitrogen with deep learning segmentation of smartphone images. And I wanted to tell you about this study uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, for the creativity aspect. Um, so there's some uh, talk amongst root phenotyping experts of do we need a, um, you know, one universal root model that can segment all roots? Um, and should we all co collect our annotations together and get this one model that processes all our data? Should we have a universal model? Um, and I think I think maybe maybe Larry York asked me that on Twitter sometime if, if that's a good idea. And what I and I think that's probably the way things will go eventually. Uh, we'll have kind of one universal model. Uh, but I also really like this idea that people can be playful and people can be creative in training their own models to ask specific research questions. And I, this was completely Marilli's idea to do this. Uh, and you can see the images B and C. But we have B is a um, uh, one model that we're really trained that's segmenting the full root system, segmenting all the roots. And then C is one that's going closer to the to the laterals or the root tips um, to quantify different aspects of the root system, sort of integrating different traits into your research questions. And you can, you know, so you can train different models on the same data set to look at different aspects of the data. It's not as simple as just detecting roots or not. And also the second reason I wanted to mention this study to you today is for the aspects to do with accessibility. So I already mentioned that the Colab Notebook um, makes this, this technology available to anybody. You don't need like a custom deep learning server or workstation or whatever. Um, as long as you can get a Google account um, or you can find a similar service to Colab. Um, but in this study, uh, Marilli Cell used uh, mobile phone cameras. Um, so basically it, the whole pipeline was, you know, using a phone camera that most of us already have mobile phone cameras and combining it with this freely available Colab notebook. So it's really kind of like we're pushing, the driving the cost down of root phenotyping. And um, so you don't have to be in like some specialized group with loads of specialized facilities. Uh, you know, you can you, you can more easily integrate root, root, um, root phenotyping image analysis pipelines, you know, regardless of if that's, you know, something your group is, is heavily invested in specific technology or not. Um, so I, I think this is a really nice study for sort of inspiration to, to, to make root phenotyping more accessible and open. Um, and a, a sort of a validation study, really what I, I think maybe what we, we should have done with the root painted paper itself uh, was actually done by an external group uh, by, by Felix Bauer and, and, and the other authors listed here in this paper called the development and validation of a deep learning based automated mini Rhizotron image analysis pipeline. Um, so this one, um, they had a really large data set of already annotated uh, root images. Um, so the facility is, is, is pretty interesting. I, I put a link to the paper, hopefully, in the slides, and if you want to read about that. But they used Rootfly basically sort of over the years and annotating, you know, 25,000 images per growth season, um, which is, is, is realistic, I think, for some of these facilities. I mean, in, in Radimax, we also have hundreds of thousands of images, and, and they would do this manually, and it would take, um, you know, 1,000 to 1,500 hours to annotate those images. Um, and, and Felix investigated developing a new pipeline in this study, which combined uh, Root Paint and Riser Vision Explorer, which I know a lot of you are aware of, um, another really cool piece of software. And 
uh, for this found that the pipeline took under 20 hours, I think around 19 hours, um, which is like 50 times faster than the uh, more manual method, which is root flag, which I, I think is not maybe like, depends what you call manual. So, so a lot of these annotation tools have like semi-automatic aspects to them, but still this, this improvement was, you know, over 50, saved 50 times uh, the time. Um, and of that, like it wasn't all manual time, right? So this 20 hours included the actual image processing time of waiting for a computer to finish. Um, so it's actually arguably like a hundred times faster. Um, and I would, and also they found like, so in terms of accuracy, they found a higher difference um, between two of the annotators that they had than between the automated analysis pipeline and each human annotator in terms of the root traits quantified. So what this indicates is that uh, the annotate, so the annotators um, agreed more with the automated system, agreed more with Root Painter than they did with each other, which kind of indicates that Root Painter might be the more reliable measure of, of root length for this type of data. Um, or at least I think it's more consistent. Um, really interesting study if you have time to, to check that out. Um, yeah, and I would also argue that this 50 times, so if you, if you do have time to read it, I highly recommend that, but I mean, the training time was a significant time they spent in this study. And, and a lot of this, I would encourage you to think a little bit about how much training time do you actually need? Because you spend a lot of time perfecting things as we'll, we'll move on to um, in a couple of slides. Um, but a lot of the time, I think you don't need a model that produces pixel perfect segmentations to ask the research questions you're asking. So they spent, I don't know if it was like seven or 12 hours interactively training this model, um, which you know, given the number of images, I think is justified. Um, but they said, they, you know, they found it's 50 times faster, but I think it could have been, um, you know, maybe, maybe like 200 or 500 times faster, but it spent less time on that interactive training and stopped training earlier. Um, so I'm, it's something I think people should maybe question is like how, you know, don't be a perfectionist basically and how accurate do you really need things? But I mean, I think they, I think they made the right choices. It's just, I think it could have been even faster. And so based on people such as Benjamin Delory and, um, uh, Felix um, using Root Painter in combination with Riser Vision Explorer, uh, we've you know been kind of working to improve the integration of those programs. So now we have a function in the um, extras menu that convert, of Root Painter to convert segmentations to Riser Vision Explorer. I plan to improve the Root Painter output even more to help streamline the integration with Riser Vision Explorer. But it should all work as it is today with the current release. If you want to use Riser Vision, another open source tool that is. Riser Vision is more designed for getting root traits. So Root Painter is designed for this task of segmentation, which is, as you can see in this image, is like recognizing what other roots in your images. And then Riser Vision is like going to give you, you know, number of root tips, uh, you know, total root length, you know, network area, number of branch points, et cetera. So I think it's really nice to use these tools uh, together. And I'm going to try to better facilitate that integration going forward. And um, so I can focus on segmentation and Riser Vision Explorer can do all that other stuff. Um, you can also get measurements direct from Root Painter, so we can talk about that. So you can get length and some region properties, uh, but the, most of the more root-specific traits are better done with Riser Vision Explorer. And you can see here the original image, the segmented version, and kind of analyzed il illustrating how Riser Vision Explorer is aware of sort of different connections between the roots. And it took a couple of years, uh, but eventually the root painter paper got published as an actual paper. The preprint uh, was hanging around for a long time. Um, if any of you are PhD students having a t hard time getting your papers published, um, just sometimes just stick at it is like some peer reviewers can be really brutal. And I, I was told initially that root painter was useless. Um, it took a really long time and a lot of other people were publishing research using root painter before I was actually able to get the manuscript accepted. Um, so yeah, I think it's not useless, obviously. Um, but yeah, this is a, it's now I'm a new phytologist. I'm really happy about that, and it's open access. The uh, software is available to download via GitHub. So there is the releases page on GitHub, um, and the paper is open access. And we have this interactive notebook tutorial for getting started. Um, so I'm going to go through that today. Uh, but first, I want to kind of show you the end result. So this is like the here's something I prepared earlier. Um, I'm just going to quickly check the comments. Um, sure. Yeah, so there are two comments actually. So, do you want to take the question now? Um, yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's ask him before it becomes too too laggy. With uh, yeah, so Massimiliano uh, is asking USB accelerator that has an edge TPU coprocessor could be a budget solution. 
I think Burnley. Um, yeah, I I think it's. I mean, it definitely sounds like it. What I have to say is, I am not an expert on USB accelerators that add edge TPU coprocessors, but it sounds it sounds like something that we should talk about. It sounds like a good idea. Um, I think the the collab tutorial is is free. So if you can have a network connection, if you can, you know, Google Drive is free. And if you can get a connection to Colab, you know, if you, if you have a Google account, if you're okay with using Google services, and I, I would, you know, I guess not everyone is, but if you're okay with using Google services and you can, that's a, that's a free budget solution. The TPU coprocessor, I mean, I guess it depends on the, I mean, I ha, I don't know the technical knowledge about TPU coprocessors, but it sounds like it. It sounds like something that I should talk to you about or read about. Um, Okay, uh, I think cropping images should be done in a specific way. I already tried to do that with my photo viewer on my laptop and it doesn't work. Okay, I'm not sure what that means. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, I guess that was a comment about something I said like a long time ago. Sorry, I'm kind of like a little bit delayed with the comment. I'm not sure what this is talking about. Um, I think perhaps uh, it's a few slides before, so maybe. Uh, see if maybe you can clarify a bit your question for Abraham. So, because I think it's something you show a few slides uh, ahead before. Yeah, maybe we can come come back to that if C is. Are you there, C? All right, I'll just uh, continue for now. But yeah, feel free to drop the questions in. Sorry, I'll uh, try to get. Try to address them quicker next time. Uh, kind of just uh, uh, plowing ahead. Um, all right. So yeah, I kind of wanted to talk, try to show um, an example of using Root Painter that I don't know if it's going to work to follow along right now because we haven't really covered how to install the software for all the different platforms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, like I said, we can do a more interactive workshop where I can help you with your specific technical problems if you have any trouble with that. Um, but yeah, I'm going to try to show you training a model right now. Um, so first, I'm going to show you the results. So this is from uh, Benjamin Delory. Um, actually, no. First, I'm going to show you the data set, which is in the end. Let me show you this. Um, and OK, great. So this is some data that has been prepared by Inez Alonso Crespo, Vicky Temperton, and Benjamin Delory. Um, and it consists of um, 100 mini Rhizotron images with 2,340 times 2,400 pixels resolution, 148 pixels a millimeter. Um, and, okay, I got the question from C. Um, so some image, I mean, some images should be cropped by image some of the stuff proceeding with annotations. Um, okay, so this is about the importance of pre-processing images before training a model. Um, so if you, so I think this is a good point by C. So basically, if you can um, crop your images um, to like a relevant region, um, especially if you can do that in an automatic, automated way, uh, for, if you have a large data set, you're going to have to use an automated way, right? It's not feasible to do it in a, in a manual way. So, but if you have a small data set, you know, like 100, 200 images, maybe even 500 images, if you can just quickly crop to the relevant region, it's going to make, you know, if you have like a big region and then like you only want to segment stuff in a small region, uh, you know, if you have like a tray or something where your roots are and you have all this noise around it, all this background clutter, um, you, yeah, cropping is going to help a lot because the task of a model is, is, is simplified because the model has to learn to handle not just the foreground in the image, but all the background in the image as well. And so you have to, you know, if, if you, um, also if you have like a really big class imbalance, so if you have like a really small, you know, if you have like riser boxes, and the root is just at the top, right? Like you can just, you know, it's an early developer root or it didn't grow that much. You know, if you just crop to those, you know, I had a project recently, I was helping someone, they had, um, you know, a bunch of root images. And if you just crop to, uh, you know, where the root is first, it's gonna make it so much easier because otherwise you're training this model to handle all of the soil that is just not relevant to your research question. So yeah, cropping does help. Cropping to relevant regions for analysis helps. Um, if you have a massive data set, you probably can't do that unless you can do it in a kind of automated way. Um, but it's not essential. So it's just about making things more efficient. So if you make your data set smaller by cropping to a relevant region, it's gonna it's gonna be easier. Anything you do to make your data set smaller, crop to the relevant 
you know, just the relevant information. It's going to make it easier to train it to handle the background artifacts, because but not aren't necessarily artifacts, but the background, um, whatever is visible in the background, because uh, it's going to have to do, handle less of it, right? So there's going to be less variation there typically. Um, so yeah, it's a good point. So if you can crop to relevant regions, it will save you a lot of time I, in most projects. Thanks. Um, so this mini rise trend data set, um, I think you see my screen still, is uh, provided by these people. And um, so this is what we're going to try to work through today um, to, to just sort of show you an example of root painted working. Um, so it's like a one gig download, which will take you some time. Um, so don't feel pressure to follow along right, right now because this video is being recorded. So you can kind of come back and, you know, work through things. Um, but don't you don't need to download this one gig download. We've prepared this 16.4 megabyte download, um, which is your like training, which is a training data set. So I'm going to explain what that means. Um, and these images are acquired from a grassland field experiment called the POEM experiment, which is really interesting about priority effects. Uh, so this is in which the order of arrival of three plant functional groups, forbs, grasses, and legumes, uh, was manipulated. Um, so this is some riser tubes um, from 18 different depths and um, different time points. Um, but it's, it's, it's a little bit challenging data set it, because it has different root speed. Root. So there's some heterogeneity in the data set because there's different root species. Um, and uh, But I also wanted to work with something today that is not too easy. So you get an idea of like, okay, what are the, some of the problems you expect when you try to use it in like a real world data set, like a like a kind of a messy Rhizotron data set, because they're always, but normally pretty challenging. Sometimes I see data sets much easier than this one, but there's normally something difficult like scratches or dew or something. So, um, and also use, we're gonna try to use Colab today. Um, so I'm gonna um, set up a notebook really quickly and let me find this. Um, so basically, if if you're following along at home, like right now, um, you can you can do the same thing as me, or if you're coming back to this video later. So, you know, I recommend reading the paper, but I appreciate it's it's quite a while to read that. So you do need to prepare a way to synchronize the data between your own computer and Google Colab. So this is what I'm using is Google Drive. So you install Google Drive for desktop. That's basically what it says in this guide. Um, so you have to, um, yeah, you have to uh, install this. Um, yeah, basically go to Google, install Google Drive for desktop. On Linux, it's a little bit more complicated. You can now- Abram. Yeah? Uh, can you increase the letter, uh, for example, Control plus? Yeah, good idea. Just to make the text bigger, and then we can say, great. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Great. Let me check. All right. So um, yeah, you, the first step is you need some way to synchronize data between your client and your server application. So I'm assuming most of you out there aren't sat on, sat on a computer with like a huge GPU in it. Um, if you are, good for you. You don't need to do any of this complicated stuff. You can just run the software. Um, but well, you need to still run the client and server, but you can do it all locally. Um, but yeah, Google Drive, uh, you can just install it here. Um, and then after that set up, um, okay, this is kind of big, but I think it's okay, right? So yeah, you, um, yeah. So just here, it's just explaining what is Root Painter, how does it work? Um, so basically, it's two. Com the software is actually two two programs that interact with each other um, because you know most people don't have a GPU on their own computer, um, so they run the client on their own computer, and the GPU runs somewhere else, and then you need a way to synchronize them. So that's how it all fits together. Um, and setting it up is the hardest thing. So once you get past that, everything is easier. I mean, uh, until you get to a model where it's like almost perfect, you know, like how do I make it better? You know, and that's kind of like another problem where I don't always have a good answer. But um, uh, yeah, so the notebook has this do every time or first time only stuff in it. So um, you should all have access to this notebook. I'm just going to drop another link in the chat. Um, I don't know how, how do I make comments? Is that a thing? Can I just put it in a private chat? I don't think I can make comments. Anyway, I'm gonna put it in the private chat. Yeah, you can put in the private chat and then we, we share. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. Um uh, yeah, so then so this tutorial is designed for anybody to, to run it in theory. So if you run into a problem or something is very confusing for you and it's not addressed in this tutorial, please let me know because it should work for everyone. Um <clears throat> uh, there's a comment. Oh, great. It's a, it's a, it's the collab tutorial. Yeah. 
Um, so actually this you don't normally need to do, but you, your runtime does need to be set to GPU because otherwise this won't work. And you need to mount the data. So I've already ran this cell. So you basically just need to click this play button and it will mount your drive. Um, so what that does is you, it will ask you to give permission to this, <coughs> excuse me, give permission to this uh, for this notebook to um, access like your Google Drive data because that's basically what's happening here. We're mounting it so we can use Google Drive to synchronize data between the client and server. Um, and uh, yeah, so this this is going to clone the repository. This command. So if you just click this play after you've mounted your drive, um, this will actually download the source code from um, GitHub and like in, you know put it in the, in you know in this collab. Uh, actually, it will put it in your Google Drive in a folder called Root Painter Source. Um, it's running a little bit slow, but it, yeah, it's just literally just connecting. You can see what code is being run. You just click the play button and it will, yeah. So literally all it's doing is, is going through these instructions. I'm not sure why it's so slow today. I've had some little bit of trouble with Google uh, Google Colab today and I'm not sure why. Um, I think the Google service might be a little bit slower than usual. Um, um, I think that might have worked anyway. It's a bit hard for me to see. Is it okay if I make my text like a little bit smaller? Is that kind of, I'll just, okay, let me just do this. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Good. Is it okay? okay. Great. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think that ran now. Uh, anyway, so then, yeah, this says prepare biopause data set for testing a set of work. So, you, so today we're not going to do this uh, because this is a, I wanted to, I wanted to try with the root data set that's provided to me from uh, Benjamin and, and Ines, et cetera. And um, yeah, so you can skip these two steps and then we're gonna, uh, and you can skip this step. So we're just gonna click on, um, actually we're not gonna click start server. We're gonna click uh, experimental alternative. So, oh, it's already running. How did that happen? Ah, that's probably why it was slow earlier. Anyway, yeah. So start server, we restricted patch size. So Colab is a little bit slow, that's a disclaimer. So you don't, you, you know, you get what you pay for a little bit, it's a little bit slow, but I tried this new alternative to, to make things work for this workshop um, within the time frame. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm specifying a restricted patch size here, but basically this is in the public notebook. You can just click play. You don't need to really worry what's going on. Um, but I'm kind of like restricting a little bit the input to the network just to make things faster for today. But probably that might put some like upper limit on the accuracy you can get of your model if you like train it for long enough. So uh, that's why it's called experimental alternative. Um, but what you should get is this output, right? So we've started the, the training procedure. Um, and actually, if you haven't, if the first time you run this, it should also create some folders for you. So it will create this drive RP sync folder, the instructions folders, etc. <coughs> and then if you want, because you've also installed Google Drive on your computer by this point, you can go into your Google Drive folder um, on your computer and you will be able to see these folders here. So we can see it's checking instructions. That's also on my local computer, right? So now we have um, this connection set up. So I have Google Drive here. You can see I've synced some images. Um, so basically, um, there is a, a link on my slides somewhere. Um, where is my slides? Uh, my slides have gone. Maybe, ah, I'm in Firefox. That's the wrong place. Let me just have a look. Here we go. Yeah. So. This is the data that we're going to work with today, primarily, this download link. So um, yeah, you can download this data, but it's basically available from uh, this data set I was discussing earlier. We have the 16.4 megabyte stuff. These are the training images. I'm going to talk about what that means. And then we have the full data set as well. Uh, we're going to work with both of them a little bit. But the training images is all that you need to like follow along if that's what you want to do. Um, so let's go back to Firefox. Um, so sorry, yeah, this is a sync instruction. So go back to my, so my server is running now. So I want to talk a bit about this training data set. Um, where are we? So I've like basically downloaded that data set from Zenodo that I showed you earlier and it's publicly available. And I put it in this data sets folder. So these folders were created by RootPainter when I ran this instruction the first time. And this is in my Google Drive. And then I have this folder of these images that were, that are, we call these training images. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit how these images were created now, but there's 300 of these, and this is what we're going to use to train a model. So they're a little bit smaller 
than um, the original images from, from Ben. So these are the original images, but are a little bit bigger. Um, and the training images are a bit smaller. And I will go through creating a training data set in a minute. I'm just going to start the model training uh, first. And then we can I can explain creating a training data set while the model is training. Um, OK, so you need to run your root painter software, um, which you should have installed. There is a um, releases page. Let me check the slides again. This is a little tricky. Uh, so you've all have access to the slides. And um, here we go. This releases page at the end. Um, this is where you download the root painter client, right? So you can download the um, Windows one, that's the XE installer, the Mac one, the Ubuntu one, um, if you run Ubuntu. Unfortunately, for other Linux distributions, um, I don't have a like installer per se or package, but I'm, uh, I guess I'm open to making them, but you can also run it from source if you want to. It's pretty straightforward to run from source. Um, and the, if you wanted to install the trainer, by the way, it, it's, it's pretty simple. Now you can install the trainer itself with PIP, but that will need to be on the, the machine with the GPU. So we're using Colab today. But if you have access to a machine with the GPU, you can install all the trainer component with PIP there. Um, but this page that is linked at the end, this uh, client downloads, takes you to these releases that I update. This one's 18 days ago. So when people find some bugs or request a feature, I will update these releases here. You have the, um, the software for each platform available. Um, OK, so I'm going to try to, um, so we've covered the data set. We have that training images I downloaded from Zenodo, the small ones, the 16 point whatever megabytes, they're in here. And now I'm going to open the client and see if I can get start the model training. Um, so I put a link to Root Painter on my desktop. Um, OK, this is, I just need to like make this small. Here we go. All right, so you don't really need to see the trainer, but the server running, but I like to check it once in a while because I'm interested in like the technical aspect of when something goes wrong. So let's create a new project for training our root segmentation model. Um, so Phenome Force uh, Project. So I just called it that for an example. And in the image directory, I now need to go to and so my drive folder, this drive RP sync folder that was created by the server, it's now on my computer, on my local computer, synced by this Google Drive thing, right? So I have access to Google Drive. Um, and I can select the, now this training data root painter demo. So this is from, um, from, from Ben, this 16 point whatever megabyte folder is in my data sets folder locally. I can select that, open it um, for my project. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, you can actually specify an existing pre-trained model if you have one, but normally I just use random weights because um, who knows? Uh, yeah, I just it's it's more like a universal way to approach training. Um, so um, yeah, and then you just get this interface open up where you can like see your your images. Um, so I just press like um, I'm I'm on Mac, so I'm just going to sort of press Command F to fit the image to the view. So you can scroll with your mouse to zoom in and out. Um, I think it might be like, you know, equivalent. I'm not sure what the equivalent is on a trackpad. Two, two fingers, that's it. Um, but yeah, if you um, command F to zoom in, and then you've got this brush here, so you can, so this is like the root painter client. You say it says network, not training. Um, actually, we just got this message, seconds to segment one image, 14.2 seconds. So it's a little bit slow the first time because it's loading some stuff up, but um, we can actually at some point, so this is, this is kind of a weakness of the, whole collab setup is this synchronization speed is a little bit slow. So we're going to update this pre-segment count uh, just to be two, uh, just to give us a little bit of time to, uh, it's going to prefetch segmentations of the images um, in front of the current image in the sequence we're working through. So we have 300 images. We won't get through that many today. Um, but yeah, the, the protocol that we talk about in the, the paper is actually, we're going to go with, um, Annotation of um, clear examples for at least six images. Um, and then we switch to corrective annotation. So actually, we kind of have to start things off. This is like almost so faint, I wouldn't bother annotating because it's not exactly a clear example. But I'm going to 
I'm going to start with this route for now. And you just annotate. So I'm using uh, Q and W to switch between the uh, foreground and background brushes. Um, and you can see there that your cursor changes. So you can see which brush you have. Um, if you annotate something incorrectly, you can press Z. The one important point about annotation of this clear examples is you don't need to annotate everything in the image. And you need to keep be a little bit mindful of the ratio between your foreground and background classes. So I say I think we say 10 times in the paper, like don't go over 10 times as much background as foreground. But the idea is just to have like some even, like, you know, not too uneven balance of foreground and background annotation. You also don't need to like when you're annotating roots at this stage, you don't need to go right to the edge, right? It's a lot faster to go like, you know, to just go like, uh, you know, on the inside, as you can see, I've done here. Anyway, we've given it some examples to help it get started. That's the idea. Um, so I'm scrolling to zoom in and out. I press E to use the eraser, uh, Z to undo if you do something wrong. Um, and yeah, Command F to fit to view. That's quite useful. And when you've like annotated one image with clear examples, you just press Save and Next. Um, I'll just explain what I just did. So this is actually, this is a segmentation of the model right now. So this is a random model. Um, so yeah, that's what it's doing. I don't know why it's doing that. That's kind of a model initialized with random weights is predicting this to the image. It doesn't know what we're looking for yet. Uh, we're going to try to train it to segment roots, right? And then, um, so yeah, but looking at the segmentation is not part of the protocol at this stage. I was just kind of testing that things are working. Um, so I'm pressing I to, to hide and show the image um, and A to hide and show the annotation. Um, and, and these are all designed. So if you're a gamer, or you ever play games, uh, you can kind of interact with Root Painter a bit like a game. So they're all, you know, you can keep your, your, your left hand on the keyboard shortcuts and, uh, you know, your muscle memory will keep you, um, you know, being able to work quickly. Um, so if you hold shift, if you want to resize your, your cursor, you can hold shift and resize it like by dragging up and down. Um, there's also the um, change brush size option if you, you know, if you really just like, okay, I definitely want to brush with like 50 pixels width and, you know, you can do that. Um, I rarely, rarely use that, but I think they're okay. I think there are cases where people got stuck with like a super large cursor and couldn't figure out how to make it smaller. So I think that's why uh, we have this like brush size option. Um, so this is a great example. You can see the roots really clearly in this image. Um, and um, basically, uh, yeah, I'm just going to annotate some roots now. So um, Yeah, so it's supposed to be like clear example. So even though this, I would say, is a root, it's kind of like hidden. So I'm just going to, the protocol is you, you do like clear clear examples of roots. Um, and I really want to just get it started um, with like, you know, say four images. And then I can kind of go through some of the slides I want to talk about. Um, so I'm just kind of like, this is a little bit arbitrary. I'm just kind of getting the model to know okay, this is what I'm looking at, and I'm getting it started before I go into the corrective annotation procedure. Um, so this is like what we call the clear annotation. So you're just supposed to give it something. Um, so one thing that, that Benjamin and I have been doing for these images is, is, is also trying to split apart these roots, because I think Benjamin's really interested in root length. So you know, drawing these lines, which isn't really in the protocol per se, but you know, uh, we've been kind of pushing it a little bit to separate the background um, in between these roots, as you can see. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of enough. I mean, you can go into as much detail as you want. So that's two images annotated. You see it says two annotated here. Uh, that's because of this, the way this protocol works. It's supposed to be different things with different number of images annotated. Uh, but basically, now we can click Start Training, um, and the network will, will start training at this point. Uh, so it's enough. You know, we have a training and validation data set, which one image in each. Um, actually, I will I will also show you the file system and how that relates to this. Because you can, it's designed so you can inspect everything on your file system at any time. So I'll just show you that after this. After I'll do a couple of annotations first, just to get things moving. Um, so you don't, yeah, you don't need to be exhaustive. It's just to like get some like clear examples. I tend to go near the roots sometimes, just to like. You know, maybe that helps within the boundary. I haven't really done any kind of validation on what kind of initial annotations are best, but generally just don't don't make it difficult for the network because uh, the whole point is to get it to converge to something and then you can fine, fine tune it later. Um, okay, we got really lucky with these images. This is really nice, easy. Um, so yeah, so this is number four. 
So I'm just, and basically, you know, the model is still doing random, right? We haven't generated any new models. So basically how it works is in the background, the model is training on the annotations that we've done so far. And because it's collab, it's a little bit slow, uh, but that's okay, you will get there. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of, um, you know, give it these, like, we say in the paper, we say six, uh, but I think with collab, it's actually better to go more than that to do, I mean, in terms of the number of clear examples you want to do at the start. Um, but maybe we'll try six today and see how it looks. We'll see how the model looks. Maybe I think 10 might be safer. Basically, you, the problem is if you add at this early stage, the problem is if you add like a really huge amount of one class. So that's why we have this like protocol telling the user, like do all the, you know, just be careful not to annotate like too much background because if you annotate like five images with like full background, like no roots and just train the model on that, it will just like, it will never learn to, to, to recognize roots. Like just at this in beginning phase, so it's kind of sensitive at this beginning phase. So you have to like give it some like clear examples, don't go too extreme. And once it's sort of converging to an approximately correct result, then you can go uh, and correct all of the mistakes of the model. And it's gonna be robust enough to, to handle that without you know, just, just only predicting soil forever. Um, but it's generally not a problem. It's generally like just, you know, just do like six, follow the protocol, you know, do six or 12 if you're really concerned about it, of these clear examples, and then we'll do the corrective annotation. Um, all right. I will, I will do, I'm gonna do at least six and then I'll show you my slides. And so, yeah, I get, guessing these are roots. I think I'm more or less confident with these images so far, but there's definitely some where it gets tricky. I'll show you. Any questions? No questions. I hope that people are still there. <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, so all right, that's kind of okay for some clear examples. So five. So the idea is I'm annotating within the root. I'm annotating my brush is thinner than the root just to avoid going outside it, just to get something to get the model started. That'll do. All right, we've got six images annotated. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the results that Ben got earlier. So that's just to get things started. Um, and from a server, uh, it's kind of like logging all this information. Um, it actually has a model now, but we haven't seen the segmentations from it. So you don't really need to know what all of this means. I find it interesting, but uh, you can see when it's saving a model. Um, you know, that, that it logs this, it, it's it's checking for the validation set uh, F1 score. And if the model improves on the validation set F1 score, it'll save it to disk. Um, and um, it's taking around 100 seconds per epoch at the moment. Um, this is a little bit faster than what you'll get if you use a normal trainer, because it's, it's this kind of reduced patch size version I created for this demo. Um, and so basically, I want to kind of go look at, to take you through the file format of a project a little bit. So we have this, I created this project here. You can see I'm annotating these images. So a project is what connects. So you have your sync directory, uh, which is what the server created. And then it's where you, um, when you first open the client, it will ask you to specify your sync directory. And you basically just have to click that folder, the drive RP sync folder that Colab created. Um, if you have your own setup, you can put the sync directory wherever you want. You can call it something else. Um, but in this example, we're just calling it drive RP sync, and that's specified when, when the server starts running. So that means the client needs to specify this folder as well. So we, so if you if you do the wrong thing, you specify the wrong sync directory, you just click some random folder when you open the client, you can go to the access menu, click specify sync directory, and then you can click that folder again and open that. And then it's like, okay, now it's all linked up. Um, but you will have a lot of problems if the sync directory isn't correct. So things will not work because um, the client needs to know where is this folder that the server also has access to. It needs to know what is this folder. And in the sync directory, you have instructions. So this is how the instructions are sent from the client to the server. So instructions are things like segment this image, start model training, stop model training, uh, segment this folder of images. 
Um, and then you have the data sets, which is you know just like it sounds, folders full of images that you're going to use for training or you want to process um, uh, with the model you've already trained. And then you have your projects, uh, which is a project connects some um, annotations. Um, a project connects with some. So, uh, Kuchi said says thanks Abraham for this excellent presentation. I'm sorry, I mispronounced your name most likely. Um, Thank you very much for that uh, comment. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's all going great. We still have uh, quite a quite a nice group uh, attending online. I was just going to take this opportunity to also thank you, Abraham. This is fantastic. It's, it's a lot of information to absorb. I just wanted to encourage the everybody that is uh, live with us. If you have any questions or if any of you are trying to do this along with the images and uh, and the platform, feel free to, to, to just post a question and uh, I'm sure Abraham will be happy to to have a little break and um, help. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I can't promise they can fix all of the specific, so we, like, the reason I can't promise to fix all of your technical issues, like, right now, is because, by all means, like, post them. Uh, but, like, sometimes people have issues, like, they can't install the software because their, like, antivirus program is, like, blocking it, and it's, like, it takes, like, two hours to figure out a solution, you know? So it's, like, I'm happy to, uh, yeah, if there's something you want to post now and something that's, by, by all means, um, ask a question. Uh, but I can't, you know, I think we're going to have to do like specific, like people's specific technical issues in like a, a more interactive, pro some of them probably in a more in like one-on-one, -on -one, like follow-up or like smaller groups or something. But by all means, you can post them and we'll see how far we can get today. Um, but like this, uh, so where was it? I was, I wanted to explain the file system a little bit. So you see these projects have been created. So a project's folder is initially created by the server when you first run it. And then the client. Okay, thanks for the nice comments, Christopher. Christopher Sp Spagnolia is, um, is, uh, is, is, he's having a good time. Excellent. Thanks, Christopher. Appreciate the kind words. So, um, uh, yeah, the projects. So the projects are um, folders which connect. Um, so I'll go through this one, which is, so the, the client creates the project. So uh, when you first open the client, I remember click create, create project. And the project connects annotations uh, with uh, models and segmentations, basically. And the, the project is what you open in the viewer like this. Um, and you can see that we have three models already. So every time, as I mentioned earlier, the way the trainer works is every time the model gets a new high score on the validation data set, it will produce a new, uh, it will save it to disk, save those parameters to disk. Um, and also we have messages. So messages is the way that the server communicates to uh, the user who's looking at a specific project. So it's all kind of connected by the file system. Um, which is really cool if you use something like Google Drive or Dropbox because it means the whole history of what's happened in your model training process is like tracked, right? In this, in your like file share system. Um, so you can now we actually only have so which so a lot of people talk about people say this in in um, in papers all the time they still get away with it that deep, in order to use deep learning you require huge amounts of annotated data. This is said like all the time and literally like I have my validation set right now is like one image like this is my validation set. You know, that's that. Those are the labels in my validation set that I'm using to train this model. I mean, how accurate is this model? It's a different question, but I think you will see that you can create annotation within an hour or two that allow you to use a deep learning model to ask, you know, um, you know, novel plant biology, novel root phenotyping questions. Uh, you don't need huge amounts of annotation to train deep learning models. Um, but to, to ask many research questions, maybe there's some way you need huge amounts of annotation. Uh, but you can see here what I'm showing is basically that. Every time I click save and next, it's just saving a PNG to the file system. And then the trainer, the server has access to these PNGs and it's, um, you know, uh, it's producing um, models if it, if it better fits at the moment. It's training on those four images here um, and, it's, and it's validating on this image, which actually is kind of a limitation. So, so we probably need to do, a lot of people ask like, oh, how do I improve my model? Um, and uh, typically it's like do some more annotations because, um, like normally, you know, there's not enough captured in your validation set or training set to get your model to learn what it is you're looking for. It's the easiest way to improve things. Also the quality of the annotations. So I'm just, cause the model hasn't, it's still predicting noise at this point, still a random model. I'm going to, cause this is an old segmentation, right? So, so nothing like gets automatically overwritten with the segmentations. It's only segmenting like new images as you get to them. Um, so I'm going to just like give some clear examples on this. Um, actually, I'm going to split split this apart here because, as I mentioned, I kind of like to um, 
I think this is going to be relevant, but that's a little bit of a deviation from protocol, but it's okay. Anyway, um, okay, now we see we have a, um, um, now we have a prediction from a model that's like somewhat meaningful. And uh, you can see there's a lot of like false positives. Um, so we're on image eight. I think given that I gave it a good pause, I'm about at least six. I think it's a good time maybe to start doing corrective annotation. Um, um, and I'm going to do like another five images and then I'm going to, um, I'm going to show you some slides. All right. So now you can see the model is learning how to annotate um, the root images, but it's not that good, as you can see. Um, so I'm basically, so the way corrective annotation works is uh, you just like need to like correct the mistakes. It's really not that complicated. Um, but you should, uh, you don't need to, um, so this uh, Yeah, so someone's asking a question. Is there any indicator telling us when we can start using our trained model? Otherwise, when we should stop annotation and start segmentation of our images? Yes, I will get to that. So it is actually this function from a menu uh, called the metrics plot, um, which right now does not have the necessary data. Um, but I will, um, I will show you this after I've annotated another uh, 40 or 50 images or so, and you will, you will see a measure of a progress. Um, I would also say that the best indicator that you have is actually the images themselves. And um, so you will be looking at the um, you'll be looking at segmentation in in like on the screen, and you will see how good your model is. So that's kind of the human in the loop interactive machine learning paradigm um, that we I was discussing earlier. And um, so I'm using quite a big brush because that saves time. Um, so yeah, there we go. That's kind of a corrected image, I guess. Um, all right, this one is looking even better. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm just going to uh, correct a, like I said, like three or four images, and then or five images, and then I'm going to do some more slides and leave it adapting. Uh, I think there's kind of some roots there. Um, so this whole pipeline is designed so literally like anybody should be able to do, use this. So if you have a problem and you can't use this, um, you need to like let me know because that's you know it's designed so you can use this. Um, but one issue that a lot of people fall into, and I think I need to somehow I don't know improve the documentation or the guidelines or hope, hopefully this video will help, is how important it is not to make certain types of annotation errors. And I'll show you what I mean. So, so if I you see here, if I wanted to say okay, I want it to like um, let me find an example. Sorry, I'm I have a new keyboard, so I'm, I wanted to like you know segment this route there, right? That's okay. I've, I've overlapped um, the annotation with the segmentation, that's okay. And there's also some false, this is a, what I call false negative reading, right? And I've annotated it now. So that's, you know, that's the protocol, that's what I'm supposed to do. But if I like annotate like something like this, like if my foreground, if my, uh, foreground annotation goes over the soil, this is like really, really damaging for, uh, for the model training progression. Yeah, Abraham, just to give you a little break. Uh, this is fantastic. You must be already tired with all the, uh, with this presentation. Uh, we have a question from uh, one of the uh, one of the attendees uh, that he's sent it in advance. It's uh, here. I can put it in the screen for you. So, can you find the link? Yeah, you go. Uh, Yes, so root painter can be integrated with Riser Vision Explorer. That is absolutely how it's designed to work. Um, so I have this uh, convert segmentations for Riser Vision Explorer. So I will show you within this session uh, training a model and segmenting images. The model accuracy is not going to be like super, super high because of the limited time today. Um, but it can be integrated with Riser Vision Explorer. And the, the question was also about um, are. So yes, um, measurements can be, so when you've segmented a folder, which I'll show you later, you can extract the measurements um, from those segmentations, including length and region properties. Um, and then you can like process those in R and do your statistics directly from data from RootPainter. Um, if you uh, want to, yeah, but all you can go to Riser Vision Explorer first, export from Riser Vision Explorer and then integrate in R. Uh, and we have this tool. So from the extra menu, convert segmentations to riser menu explorer. But I didn't yet explain how to segment a folder of images. So we should like, I need to kind of explain that a little bit. But I will do some training for a while first. Um, 
So does and can the server be integrated into a HPCC computing environment? Um, so yes, uh, if you have uh, access to the GPU, you can, you can synchronize the files, you can definitely do that. That's a recommended way of doing it. Um, um, how suitable is it to use pics of different qualities, DPI for training later on analyzing real images? So that's from Amit Kumar. Um, I would say that you need to be careful if you're if the images you're analyzing are different to the images you used for training. Um, so if your training data set has mi mixture of DPIs and has um, different qualities, um, and then that's, you know, all of your data has this mixture, um, I don't think that's a problem. But if you train it on like one quality and then you run it on images with a different quality, I, I think you might, you might have a problem there. You're probably gonna run into issues. Um, so I, I would expect the issues to be if you train it on, if you train it on high quality images and then you run it on low quality images, your model's going to get confused. Um, yes, yeah. So I would say it's 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 fine to mix it all together, but just mix it all together in both you, in the in the data set you use for training. Um, so so some of you so then we can work through it here and we can make the model process that heterogeneous data set. It's okay to have a heterogeneous data set if you can like train your model to handle it. But if the model has never seen an image with a certain DPI and just suddenly you've thrown it at the model, you're probably gonna have some trouble. And uh, so that's the kind of the main shift. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna move on from this image because I'm uh, yeah, also by the way, so when you're annotating, um I, I, I have a video on so it's in the supplementary material of the paper, it's another video where it's like I, I train a biopolis model and and um, okay, this is good because I can do some foreground annotations. I will do this one, and then I'm going to go through some, show some like here, some final results that Ben prepared. Um, but I'm going to try to do 80, 80 images today. I think. Okay, this is a really hard image to annotate. I don't know what I'm doing here. This is really difficult. <laughs> like some of this. So is this new feature as well? Um, uh, how do I get out of this? Uh, okay, I don't know. It's kind of like. Uh, here we go. Uh, so there's this new feature as well. You can um, press, uh, so it's a view menu. You have this view image context. It's command C. I mean, on Windows, I guess it's another key, but control C or something. I'm not sure. It will be there from a menu. And then you can press command C. Uh, OK, original directory not yet specified. So then you have to specify the original directory. Um, so I think this will work if the images that Ben sent me are from the 100 images that he originally sent me. Let me see if this works. Downloaded. So uh, yeah, this is the one. Yes, this works. Great. So now you can see um, now you can see the image in like the larger context. So I just selected. So this is my training data set that I'm working through here. But that training data set, the data set it was produced from, if you want to see the context of the image you're annotating in that original training image, uh, you can select that, you know, command C or go to the view menu, view image and context and see. Because if you're not sure if something's a root, you want to see the broader context, this might, you know, there are certain situations where you just, you know, this is designed to, to speed up you looking for the original images to like kind of analyze it. So uh, that's kind of a useful feature sometimes. Um, I'm going to annotate this image because I think the model kind of needs some annotation. Um, uh, let me just see. So some of the faint roots, I think I'm just not not going to work with today because they're like really hard for me to see and just in the interests of like time and like practicality. Um, and if it's but one thing I will say is that when you're training, when you're annotating, you don't need to. Um, uh, you don't need to annotate everything. So if there's something you're not sure about, so you should annotate clear mistakes. And that's really important for the metrics plot I will show you later. Um, but if you don't, you don't need to, if there's something you're like, you're not sure, is it background, is it foreground? You should like background being not roots in this case and foreground being roots, you should leave it. That's, that's what we recommend. Because if you annotate it and there's a chance you got it wrong or it's just an ambiguous example, um, then that's what we call a uh, label noise in, in machine learning. And that's going to cause, that could potentially cause issues for your model. So, so only annotate things you're sure about. Um, I'm not going to be a perfectionist about the boundaries today. Um, you can spend an infinite amount of time on any given image, um, but I'm just, you know, I'm going to do it approximately correct. 
um, by going within the boundaries. So going outside the boundaries like this, that's really bad. So again, I mentioned before, it's like the error should be an under annotation, not an over annotation, if that makes sense. Um, if you want to save time. Hey, Abraham, uh, I have also, uh, we have also shared one question that was uh, previously uh, initially sent by Catherine. I don't know if she's in the audience, but she might want to watch the video later. So if you would like to have a look, it's in two parts. She gave an explanation of what her work is about, and she would like if she needs to train a root painter separately for the different species she's working in. Yeah, so I think this was briefly discussed earlier. So, so I, I recommend, so if you have access to all of your images already, or you, you can get just get access to all of the images um, at once, um, you should just train one model to handle everything. I think that's much more efficient than training separate models. The only case where you might not want to do that is where you physically can't, where you physically only have access to one image because you haven't collected the other images yet, and you, you have to get some preliminary data. Um, and then there's a whole other set of approaches that you can try. But if you can get access to your images and you can train a model and analyze them all with root painting, just, just train one model, treat them as one data set and process it. Um, unless there's like conflicting things. So I, I talked about Marilli's data set as well, where Marilli is training different models to, to analyze the data in different ways. And then if you, you really want to like analyze different time points in different ways, where the different models will see different things at different time points, then you know you might want to be a bit more careful and you might want to train multiple models but i think probably if you just want to like segment roots uh you should train combine all your images in one data set create a training data set and um, and yeah just do it all at once don't don't split it apart into like six different tasks and um, so this is kind of hard i might have to move on from this soon because this image is a little tricky but uh it's very uh, blurry and um, so this I'm going to like kind of patch it up the best I can, I think, and then leave some of the ambiguous regions. I think that's kind of good enough for now because uh, I need to move on. Okay, nice. Things are getting better. Um, but I wanted to, while I remember, um, I'll just do this one quick. It's, it can get a little bit addictive. It's a little bit like a game. Um, so I hope, you, I hope you have fun training your root models. It's, uh, it's designed to be fun. Um, so, oh, I don't know what's going on here. Anyway, I said I would show some slides. Where are those slides? Did I show my slides? Uh, um, yeah, I wanted to just talk about Ben's results. So we're not going to get time to make the most accurate model today, uh, but Ben has already done this. So Ben and Ines um, have been training these models. Um, so um, yeah, basically they've already done, worked on this data set. So here's some of their results. Um, so you can, this is the kind of thing that just, if you're wondering like, you know, if you try this at home and you're wondering how accurate should, should, my, 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 you know, should my model be, you know, this is what Ben did and he has some experience with the software, he, you know, he, and he spent some, I don't know how many hours he spent training this model. Um, but you know, these are the kind of results you'd expect. So he's segmenting these kind of noisy risotron images with Root Painter. Um, so there's no like you know hyperparameter tuning or anything. It's just using root paint out of the box, training this model by using the corrective annotation protocol. I think Ben uses maybe 20 clear examples at the start, which is like super super stable. So he you know, but I use like six and it works fine. But it, it it's uh, yeah. I mean, basically the main difference between this what you see and what I'm currently annotating is just the amount of images that have been annotated or the amount of time that's been spent annotating. Annotating. Um, but these are the kind of results you should expect for Rhizotron images. Um, so yeah, there's still some errors, so it's important to be aware that you still will get some error. Sorry, there's a new question? Yeah, there was uh, actually, I, I find this one quite curious because it's about the uh, underwater um, images. Would you like to, do you have any feedback for Andrea? Uh, benthic species. Um, so, uh, I don't see a specific problem with working with underwater images um, as long as um, you can recognize um, what's in the images. Um, I don't. I don't think that's going to cause a problem. Um, in terms of recognizing, um, you know, in terms of quantifying different things that look similar, I think. I think that's. Um, if you can't see the difference between the, the two different um, 
species in the images, I think you won't be able to train a model to do that. That's what I think. I think it's too hard. You need to be able to see the difference. Um, there needs to be some kind of obvious difference there that you can see. If you can rec if you can reliably recognize the difference yourself, you don't need to explain what, what how you can do it, but if you can't reliably do it yourself, I don't think you can you can train a model to do it because you have a teacher in the end in this case. So if you can't see the difference, it's probably not going to work. But I don't see any problem with uh, working with underwater images. In fact, people are already doing it. And uh, there's uh, some teams working with um, sponge research for quantifying uh, changes in sponges with different properties in the water and things like this for deep sea analysis. Um, so yeah, these are ben Ben's images from a model he trained earlier. I just kind of want to show you what to expect. Um, and now I will go back and do some annotation. I'm kind of going a little bit slowly because I'm like talking a lot, but that's also, uh, I think that's good as well because it probably got a bit boring if you were just watching me annotate. Um, I can't actually tell what this is. It's like so thin. Uh, I might just leave it. Let me have a look. Ah, that's not, it's not a root. So I'm not, I'm going to say it's not a root. Um, so yeah, there we go. Um, nice. Um, yeah, so we've got some false positives here. This is not so great. Um, so this is where things might go wrong if you annotate like a lot of images of green in a row and then you need to like do more clear examples. So I did like six or eight this time, which is a little bit risky. Um, but yeah, okay, great. We've got some roots here. Um, um, okay, cool. No more questions. I can. Questions are very welcome. I'm just, uh, I just want to get a little bit of annotation in so I can show you the model converging. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm not going to annotate all of that because it's getting a bit murky there. I'm just going to, um, and this is obviously like something on the glass. It's not, not roots. Um, so you can use this for any type of data. Like we showed you in the, in the presentation, nodules, biopores, even the methane. Um, I'm working with radiotherapy at the moment and, and analyzing images of, of you know, I work with, with images of hearts and lungs and things like this. So it's kind of a generic unit model that's used for segmentation. Um, you don't have to use it just for roots if you have other things you want to analyze. It's, uh, it's nice to see the different um, different types of things approached. Um, okay, I think that's a root. So this is like this is why this data set is still a challenging because these species look very different. Some of these roots, I'm not even sure what, what this is. Ben will talk about this data, I think, um, in the next Phenome Force workshop. Um, so here I like annotated something that has already been predicted, which is like not necessary. That's not good, but it's not, you know, it doesn't hurt anything. It's just like not a great use of time. Um, so yeah, it's supposed to target towards the errors. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there. Um, uh, yeah, I really hope this model converges. I do not wanna fail in this like recorded video, but like, yeah, we have like eight models generated. It seems to be doing pretty well. Um, so you can see here that, that you don't need to look at the server output, but you know we can see. I can see that things are like you know, it's just like it's fitting the data. You know, things are not going terribly. This is nice. Um, so model when it improves, it generates a new model. So if it never generates a new model, and um, you know if you just stuck on one model, it means your model isn't hasn't improved. You know that's one way you can see it. So this is in your file system here. You shouldn't have to look at this, but if things are going wrong, you can you know new models mean in practice, new potential for improvement in terms of segmentation quality. And eight is like quite a lot for, for the, the amount of time. So it means things are going okay. Um, yeah, you you know, you can tell if, if, if your annotations are making a difference, if you get these new models, like sort of spat out in the models folder, you know. Um, um, so this is like super thin root, but I'm, I'm gonna go for it. I think it's kind of just so obviously a root. These images are like really, really um, detailed images. It's like 148 pixels per millimeter. So what looks like here, like maybe a thick root is actually really, really thin. Um, okay. It does take some time. It's, it's like, why is it getting this noise in the soil? It does take some time with Colab for it to like get rid of these errors, but I've tried this before and it will, you know, it will learn to adapt. Abram, just for you know, uh, we have other 15 minutes, okay? 
Okay. Thank you. Minutes. All right. We might have to finish early today, but I got to. I kind of got to show you the. Um, I might have to just process the data because I wanted to kind of show the, the data processing steps, and I think I. I think things went a little bit slower than I'd originally planned, but I will. I will just try to finish this up pretty quick. And um, I showed you Ben's earlier segmentations, which show you how to because you need you need like at least a good a good couple hours on this data to get really nice results. Um, of like correcting the mistakes your model makes, but I will. I want to show the full kind of pipeline, um, and so I will try to wrap that up. So yeah, you press I sometimes if you're searching for these like false positives, you can press I to hide the image. You can see see it down um, down here. You have this uh, you know these checkboxes as well if you want to use those. It's it's kind of easy to use, but it's also easy to get wrong. Like in, you know, if you just kind of you know the annotation protocol is is a little bit tricky. Let me. Uh, okay, that is not a root. Uh, cool. I think there's a little bit. Of, ah, this is terrible. Anyway, this is this is the point, right? So we can now you know we can fix our model. I'm going to give it another couple minutes on this, see if I can get a better model. And then I will have to skip ahead and take my substandard model and process the data set just to show you that aspect of the pipeline. Uh, th thanks, Norman, for the kind words. I really appreciate that. Uh, Um, so you can see here, you could just annotate whatever you wanted. So I'm just annotating roots, but you could you can train them all to you know annotate this you know the stones if you want whatever you know biopores nodules as we showed you this um, a few different applications coming up. What as long as you can see it clearly in your image and you can be consistent in, in how you you annotate it, I think you you can try. I'm just gonna um, I'm just gonna skip ahead because I need to. Give it a few more images in my limited time. It's a challenge. Okay, it's, get, it's getting there. It, I can feel the false positives coming. They're going to be in here. Let's see. Uh, so, yeah, it's, now it's lagging a little bit behind. So, what happens is when you, things start to lag with, with Colab, you can just put your pre-segment count and put that up a little bit. So, you know, I'm just going to put it up to five. Um, don't go like too high because basically, if you go, it's like pre-fetching the images. So, the risk with putting pre-segment too high is that you end up like segmenting the images in front with like the model you have right now, um, which means that they won't get segmented if a new model is created. Um, um, Clement St. Cast says, how appropriate is root painter when we have color gradient on large images, for example, humidity gradient on a scan of riser box, i.e. more will to more upon depth darker. Um, appropriate, I would say, like, um, like this is this is still more or less the state of the art in image analysis, uh, so UNET segmentation, convolutional neural networks. So if you want to like automatically segment something in your images, I think root painter is, is you know, the binary segmentation. I think root paint is appropriate. Um, so if you have like a large color gradient, I wouldn't necessarily worry about that. Root painter doesn't rely on like specific colors necessarily. It will figure out other patterns in the image if it needs to, if you can annotate whatever it is you're looking for. Um, so you don't need to worry about, you know, it, it doesn't classify necessarily based on color. It can use other patterns as well. So I would give it a try. Um, uh, and uh, some kind words there from Clement St. Cass. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope it. I hope that this is useful. I hope that somebody gets some benefit from this in their phenotyping research. Um, so yeah. So we're kind of getting to the point. I'm kind of. I've got like 12 minutes left. So I need to. Um, I need to kind of wrap up at some point. Um, so I'm just going to do like another 10 as quickly as I can. I, there's a few things that I really need to cover, actually. So I'm just going to be really quick on these images. Uh, that's not a root. Um, I think. Uh, anyway, let's just assume. Um, 
So you can see here the image is getting saved to the um, you know training and validation set and and also the segmentation. So this is what I'm viewing in the in the folder here. These are these are also getting saved as well. So but when you actually process a data set, um, so I'll show you now. So um, um, so okay, a few things. Let me go through this slowly. So oh, it's getting good. Look at that. All right. So basically. Um, creating training data sets. So I'm just gonna like close this project for a second. Everything is saved to disk, except the current image you're annotating, as you can see here, everything's in disk. So you don't need to worry about like losing data. Um, so creating a training data set. So the, the data I've just been training on is a training data set. And then, um, uh, so I'm just gonna create a test training data set just to show you how to do that. Um, so these are like the large images from Ben that I showed you earlier. This is not the training data set, just the big images, like one gig, all those images. So what I need to do is create like a smaller, these smaller patches to work through for the training. So I can select like a random sample you can see here. Normally I'd go with like all images, one per tile. If you have enough images, you know you're not gonna run out of training images. You can get like a thousand or whatever. Um, but you know, here I'm gonna go through, I'm just gonna take 10 samples and one per image. And I'm gonna do, uh, you know, target size of 700. So I'll split them up into even size patches from the image and create this training data set. Um, and it gives you estimated time remaining. So we've got like six seconds. It's a little bit slow because it's saving to a Google Drive and normally be a little faster, I think. Training data set complete. So this data set, so I'm, I've been training the whole thing on this like training data set that Ben prepared. And, and you can just download that training data set from the, the Nodo link. Um, but this is the one I just created like right now. And you can see it's these smaller patches. Um, so that's how you create a data set from your images. You should create a training data set with a target size of somewhere between like 700 and 900. Um, and I recommend, because if you start working with really big images and you can train directly on really big images, but it's things are gonna really start to slow down and uh, you're gonna have, um, um, you're gonna have, you're gonna have challenges with the whole cap, you know, it's gonna take you so long to finish one image, you're not gonna get to the next. So the feedback loop is slower, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, I'm just going to quickly do come back to the questions later because I might be running out of time. Um, so let's say my model had finished, and I'm going to open that project, Phenome Force project. Here we go. Just click on that Seg Proj folder, Seg Proj file. So let's say I was happy with this model. Um, <laughs> obviously, like we we want to keep improving it, but I have eight minutes, so I just need to wrap things up a little bit. Um, but anyway, let's say we're happy with this model. So um, you can let it finish training. Um, so it's here. It's, it's um, it will send this message at the bottom, like after each epoch finishes, saying, you know, training one of sixty epochs. Here you see it now. Training one of sixty epochs without progress. And you could let it finish. So it's sixty epochs without progress. It finishes on its own. Get, you know, given you 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 know you don't want to annotate anymore or whatever. Um, and also, I ah, I need to cover this uh, metrics plot. Here we go. So the metrics plot. I didn't get enough time today to annotate that many images, uh, but like the metrics plot will show you, you know, okay, accuracy still looks good. We can see for each image, um, this metrics plot here from the extras menu uh, shows you the difference between the initial segmentation and the corrected segmentation. So it provides you with a way to quantify the progress in the accuracy of your model over time. Um, based on the prediction of that model on new data. Because each image that you annotate is like a new image. Um, and then you can see here also with this plot, you can like click on the images to like inspect them. You know, so if you see some outlier, like, oh, this one looks, looks pretty bad. What happened here? You know, was it an annotation error, for example? This one looks good. Okay, it was this kind of image. Um, you, you, can, you can export this plot as well to, you know, whatever format you want. Um, but you know, this is how you would tell if your model has, has got a good enough accuracy, and also by looking at the segmentations themselves. And if you want, you can just like stop training, um, and then you can like segment a folder. So let's say we wanted to segment a folder. I've actually prepared a folder in the datasets folder. I have seven minutes left uh, to do your datasets. Uh, so this is what like just like a few images from from Ben's big dataset called Four Comp, and I'm just going to select that. So this is like literally I wanted to process some root images with my trained model, right? So that's a like kind of an essential thing. And then what I normally do, I go to my, I put my output in the projects folder here, and I'll just create a folder called results. Um, and in here, put like seg, whatever, segmentation in my results folder. And then you have to specify a model file. 
Um, and here you need to go into your project and the model, so the latest model is the best one so far, right? That's typically how it works. Um, so you select this. Um, and so I've selected my images. I'm gonna quickly show you what those images are. Um, so this, these are just literally, just for testing, I've just got a few images now, so it's not gonna take too long. Um, so these are the big images, right? So we wanna process these big images on our model trained with the smaller tiles. Um, so now I just click like segment. Um, so it's only six luckily, cause I wanna just like quickly get this demo finished in like six minute time limit. Um, but yeah. It, it, I'm sorry for interrupting you, Abraham. Uh, we have decided that uh, we can extend it 10 more minutes if that's okay with you. So you are able to finish uh, with the presentation. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, I'll just, I'll do my best, but I think maybe at some point it's good to have a time limit anyway, right? Otherwise I'll just keep going. And... Sounds great, thank you. <laughs> yeah, but I'll do my, I do my best. Um, I just wanted to cover like actually processing the data with the train model, but, but thank you for the extension. Um, so you can see the server. You don't need to look at the server output. It's just, you know, you can see stuff's going on. It's segmenting these images uh, with, with that model. Um, so yeah, we've got some, it's estimating time remaining, which is, uh, it's going up. Oh no, I hope it doesn't go over 10 minutes. No, no. This is gonna go down, I'm sure. Do you want to address a few questions meanwhile? Oh yeah, good idea. Uh, can root and paint be used for identifying two different stuffs? For example, identifying root and then lesions on root. Um, that is multi-class root painter, which does exist. Uh, so you can train it, you can have multiple different foreground classes and you can train a model to detect those. Um, but it's kind of like in testing. So it's, I have a project at the moment where, um, yeah, we're, we're still testing that. It's all on GitHub. So if you want to try out the multi-class root painter, it's a branch on GitHub. Um, but for that task, for example, roots and then lesions on roots, I would probably just train like two models in the root painter because uh, training models is normally quite quick. Um, so, so if it's just two things, you could just use two binary models. But if you have many things, the multi-class root painter is, is really, you know, it's designed to cover that. But it's not like, it's not as well tested yet. It's not as well polished. Like this is like, I'm really confident that this software I'm talking about right now will work for many of you out of the box. The multi-class root painter is still a little bit like, we're still testing it. Um, uh, differentiating between roots of different crops in an intercropping system. I would say like, if you can do it in your images, then probably you can train root painter to do it. But if you can't see the difference, then probably it won't be able to do it. Uh, so probably no, because generally people have to like, have roots with different, you know, they, they will use special roots with different colors or things like this. So normally it's it's hard to reliably tell the difference between two different crops of roots. Normally it's hard. So I would say that probably you can't do that unless you do something special with your roots that give them a different color. Um, but there are cases where you will if they do look like substantially different. All right, we processed our data set. So now I'm gonna uh, show you what happened. Um, uh, so you get this. Uh, so yeah, I output. Um, so everything is based on you being able to like navigate the file system. So I output it to this like, um, what is it? This, uh, yeah, if you go in projects, uh, the phenome force project, I output the segmentations. I know this is the segmentations that are done while you're interactively training. So be careful you don't confuse these. It's in the results in the segmentation folder. Um, and this is what we generated. So we have some root segmentations with our not yet complete. I'd say I want to get to 80 or 100 models. So this model is not, the training is not yet finished. That's why I showed you Ben's results from earlier. Um, kind of went a little bit slower today, but it was also nice to go into detail on some of these topics. Um, and then if you want to see these segmentations with the original images for like inspecting the quality of them, there's this uh, extract composites function where you can um, go um, projects, you know, for project, uh, what was it? What am I selecting? Wait a minute. Let me check out again. Specify the segmentation directory. Um, so that's these results um, in the seg folder, specify image directory. So that's the, the data set that you generated the segmentations for, which is for comp. And um, then specify composites directory. And I'm gonna put this in my, uh, in my results folder, I'm gonna create a new folder. Uh, called comp for my composites. So composites is just like an image and segmentation shown together. Um, and I call it, I, I just call them composites. Um, 
Uh, so that's a little bit faster. It's all running on the client. This doesn't use a server and it's complete now. So if we go up, we can see the composites are there um, and we can just open these. These are just images. You can drop them straight into your manuscript or you know your presentation um, and show them, okay, here's how good my model is on this data. So that image actually doesn't look terrible. You could remove this stuff in Rise of Vision Explorer, but this is like, you know, I, I actually, I was a little bit late to start training as I mentioned. So um, you probably need to do like 80 or 100 images to train the model to be accurate on these images. But you can see that things are heading in the right direction. Um, um, and then what about traits? So what if we get, someone asked about getting this in R. So measurements, let's extract, let's say we want to extract length from these segmentations. So I've just use these six images because everything needs to be a little bit fast, which is nice also. Um, so then, uh, yeah, I'm going to put that in, put my results in uh, the results here. Here we go, save as length uh, data. Um, so yeah, I'm just analyzing, extracting length from the segmentation. So this is your skeletonization and then pixel counting. It's really simple. Um, but it's also pretty accurate, I think. Um, I don't think you need to worry too much about more advanced uh, corrections for like partial, you know, different angles and stuff. There are some, but there are some limitations to just doing skeletonization and pixel count. Um, and then if I don't have, a, I'm not going to try and open R right now because I, but yeah, you can open, you know, you can see that you could analyze in this in R and if, if you had your images, you know, you can connect whatever is in your image file name to different, different species or different treatments. You know, you can start to do, to run your t-tests or correlations or whatever it is uh, based on root length and the different images, uh, linking back to depth or whatever else. Um, um, and what else? Region properties, I can maybe show that. Um, measurements, extract region properties. So I'll be very quick. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go back to these six images that I created. Um, results in input the CSV results. Region data. So this is less relevant for roots, um, and eccentricity causes problems if you have extremely large images. So, but I mean, you know, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So yeah, this is this is like the data you can get from Root Painter, and for many studies, this is relevant. Um, also, we have counts as well, but a lot of studies they want to do like extraction and. Uh, they want to do like thresholding as well. So from region properties, you get this, uh, you get the coordinates, you get the diameter area perimeter and you can get eccentricity. I didn't put that option on today, um, but a lot of people want to filter by area. So if they don't want to have like two pixel objects or something. So, so getting count data, you can get count data direct from Root Painter or you can get this region property and then filter by area in R or Excel or whatever and do it that way. Um, but I think, um, I think that just about covers it. I mean, I would, um, where do we go? Oh yeah, convert segmentations for Rise of Vision Explorer. So um, yeah, you can use this function if you want to get them ready for exporting with Rise of Vision. Um, I'll be, uh, go. Nice. So, um, it's all kind of designed to um, be used via this GUI and you can, I mean, I, I kind of, I, I love the command line, but I quite like, um, I quite like working with this kind of GUI based system sometimes because you, you end up with like, otherwise you end up with a lot of scripts lying around. So it's nice to have one tool where you can just do all your image analysis. Um, so this is ready for Riser Vision in a format that Riser Vision likes. Um, I apologize for low quality. I, I a little bit went a little bit slow early on. Um, I thought I'd go faster. Um, but yeah, you need to get to like around 80 to 100 images, I know, on this data set um, to get the quality um, to, um, ah, yeah. You can see. So the idea is you should you should go through and correct everything. But we don't have time today. Um, but you can try that in your own time. Um, as I showed you in the, in the presentation, we have the, um, um, where is the presentation? I keep losing this presentation. But yeah, the... Uh, let me go in here. As I showed you in the document here, we have, um, yeah, it's gonna look like this if you if you spend a couple hours on it, uh, things are gonna get a little bit better. Um, but yeah, today we don't have time to get this level of results, but hopefully, you, you, you know, you're kind of convinced that you could go that way um, if you kept going. Um, and uh, I think the metrics plot is, uh, actually, I don't wanna do that, that's different. But the metrics plot, I think, is, is a really exciting way to track your, track your progress. Um, 
um, to get an idea of like, you know, how close you, you know, is the model improving? How close are you to, to having the dice score you want or the energy you want? Um, okay, no more questions. Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of, um, I think that's everything I wanted to cover. I, I wanted to spend more time on training the model um, to show you that it can get more accurate. But I guess, I guess. Yeah, that's yeah don't worry. We know. <laughs> We know how workshops are. Actually, this is our main idea here in the community is just to show how to do stuff, right? Not necessarily to be perfect, but uh, uh, only to see how people are doing research, how they are making their own pipelines. That really helps. So thank you so much, man. That was amazing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you a lot for inviting me. And I don't know, how many people are still there? Can you see the number? You still have 12. 12 yeah. okay yeah. everyone left. Yeah. but what's happened is many people uh stay uh, normally they watch afterwards because they know that the video stay on youtube and then they repeat and repeat again you know following the pipeline don't worry <laughs> so i was gonna say like if anybody i mean i guess i don't know if they're gonna watch the video but if anybody wants a more practical workshop where we'll like help individual people with their own projects me and me and benjamin were discussing like basically if we have demand like if there's at least you know five or ten people then we can we can do something more practical to help people with their projects with their image analysis tasks and um, so just like let us know get in touch i think you know you can get my email from the it's in this paper right you can contact me through that and then um, yeah just yeah if you want like a practical workshop and you need more help with your project just let me let me know yeah thank you so much yeah in uh so feel free to also say something for the audience. And also, please, guys, if you are watching there, type here uh, what you thought about this presentation. Also help us sharing this video with your colleagues, with your community, All right? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I mean, uh, oh, I have a question. So Christopher is unable to advance to the next image. Is a problem with setting the image directory for Google Drive? Yeah, probably. I would say that's probably a uh, problem is the uh, Google Drive setup. Um, but let's let like Christopher, if you can reach out. So my email is in this. Uh, it's a correspondence email for this the root painter paper. And um, like let's let's maybe do another workshop in, a, in 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 a few days and do like work through people's practical problems because I think a lot of people probably have the same problems setting up Google Drive and things like this. Um, but like uh, maybe today is like it's, it's already been like two hours, so I think. Maybe we should do it like next time. Um. Yeah, and we always can schedule another workshop and then you can come and continue with the data analysis. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, ben but that's where Benjamin's uh, presentation is gonna follow up. So he's, um, he's gonna show, okay, once you've got these measurements from your segmentations, how do you actually use that in like a root study? Um, so, you know, for anyone who's who wants to to understand the kind of downstream analysis after after segmenting your images, I, I highly recommend going to Benjamin Delory's workshop. Um, I think it's next it's next week, right? It's like in a week. Exactly. Yeah, and we're not we're gonna present right now. So thank you so yeah. much for being here and everybody saying thank you and uh they love thank your you presentation. <laughs> thank you. Uh, bye bye. Thank Adrian. you so much. No, thank you, seriously. Thank you so much for, for having me and letting me share my technology and my research. It's been, uh, it's been great. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank I you. <laughs> Bye. All right, I'm in. Maya, do you want to introduce our next, our next presentation? Yes. Since Benjamin has been uh, also participating in the, in the background today, I would like, uh, Benjamin, if you would like to, uh, I will, share, I, will, I will get you on the screen. So our next speaker, it will be from Friday, it will be a different day. It's uh, okay. Benjamin Delore from the Lufana University in Germany. And his, uh, his presentation, his workshop is gonna be quite complementary and aligned with the one today. We are gonna also explore a bit uh, further. If you would like to say a few words, Benjamin, about what the workshop will be. Yeah, I think the workshop will be very complementary to what uh, Abraham just did today. So. I would like to illustrate different steps of setting up an experiment using riser boxes or mini riser trons. So how we can set it up in the field, for example, how do we collect the images and how do we analyze them? Of course, I analyze them mainly with root painter, but this has been covered by uh, Abraham today. So once you have the segmented images, what do we do with them later on? 
how can you extract relevant traits for your analysis and how do you then analyze your distribution uh, in the field or in your riser boxes, for example. So that's that's going to be the main goal of the workshop next week. I'm sure that our audience and our attendees are looking forward to next week. To, and I definitely am. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, and, well, no problem. I just want to thank you, I mean, all the team, our speaker, uh, Abraham Hunt has done a fantastic job and I think he deserves yeah. a rest now for the rest of the day. I have shared in the chat uh, uh, your email, so like I say, anybody can contact him. And uh, well, I want to thank you all the people that have registered. We have nearly 100 people registered. I suppose many of you will come later and rewatch the video. And thank you for all your questions and the active participation and the positive feedback. Particularly, we have a great positive feedback. I think it's well deserved. Uh, all all right. Yeah. Great. So thank you guys, and uh, we we'll see you next week. See you next week. Feel free to contact us and our speakers. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.